Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming back. We are going to start 2 Kings tonight. We're not going to get all the way through chapters 1 through 8, but they all kind of go together. I want to lay the foundation for this because this is a particularly interesting... Uh, I, I don't want to talk very much about this yet because I, I want to spend more time on it. But this map right here, it's got what I've got here on the board. It's got the list of the Aramean kings. We've been talking about Ben-Hadad, the first, Ben-Hadad the second. In fact, this is the king of the Arameans from up north, which is Syria today. Uh, he's the one that we've spent a lot of time with. He's been dealing with Ahab. He's the one that was let go, and the prophet then condemned Ahab for letting him go. He's going to be overthrown by Haziel. And you see he's the third on our list. And that's the beginning of a new dynasty. He's the one that Elijah was told down on Mount Sinai to go anoint a new king of the Arameans. He's not going to do that. Elisha will do that. Haziel will be replaced by his son, Ben-Hadad III. And so there's two dynasties here, Ben-Hadad I, Ben-Hadad II, father and son. Then there's an overthrow by Haziel, and his son will replace him. That's the king of the Arameans. And that's going to take us up through, we've been talking about these kings these two, and we're going to be talking about these two uh, beginning second kings. Now, you know the kings of Israel. You know Omri <coughs> replaced Baasha and, and that whole group there with a, there's an overthrow. He had a son named Ahab who married Jezebel and he died right at the end of the, the uh, chapter, or end of first kings last week. His son Ahaziah will replace him. He's going to reign for two years and then he's going to fall out of a window. He's going to fall through the lattice and that's kind of where a first or second kings picks up with Ahaziah going down to Ekron, asking to meet with the, uh, uh, the uh, sending messengers down to meet with the, the god of the, the Philistines from Ekron, find out if he's going to live or not. And that's where e e Elijah interrupts the story again, and he goes down and intercepts Ahaziah's pasta that goes down to check, and, and he says, what are you asking the god of, of the Philistines for? Well, anyway, we'll read that in chapter 1 of 2 Kings. When he dies, then, after two years, Ahab's next son, Jehoram, then becomes the king. He's going to eventually be overthrown by Jehu, and then this begins another new dynasty, Jehu, and then he'll be followed by Jehoahaz. So Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram are all of the same family, with Ahab marrying Jezebel. They have two sons, Ahaziah and Jehoram, and a daughter named Athaliah, who Jehoshaphat, in his political wisdom, uh, political correctness, I suppose. Jehoshaphat makes a treaty with Ahab uh, and his son Jehoram. Now again, notice the Jehoram, Jehoram. There's the same names, Ahaziah, Ahaziah. Those are different different people. This is Israel. This is Judah, but similar names or the same names. Anyway, Jeho Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram is going to marry Athaliah and Ahab's daughter. Excuse me, Ahab's and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. <coughs> Uh, Jehoram, then they have a son named Ahaziah, and he's going to be interacting up with these kings because he's, he's then cousins, I guess you'd say. He's, he's related to these guys. And so that makes kind of, they're trying to marry the, the kingdoms together. He's going to get killed by Jehu when Jehu kills Jehoram. So Ahaziah is killed, leaving, and then Jehu wipes out this entire family and, with, and all the Baal worshippers leaving Athaliah alone by herself in Judah, where she then does likewise. She kills the whole house of her family, all of her grandsons, grand, everybody, except Joash. He's hidden away, a son of David, from uh, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, and then Joash, which would be her grandson. Uh, he's spared, and then we pick the story up there again. And then Athaliah is going to eventually be killed. <coughs> That's the kings that we're going to be dealing with. And it's kind of important to understand the flow of it, kind of enjoy the story. Now, on this map that we have right here that I've given to you, I could spend a lot of time on this, but you've got the names of those kings, the Aramean kings, and the dates. And now the dates, all of a sudden, the dates are now no longer guesses. I mean, we, there's always a debate, but now these dates are, are pretty solid because we've got them documented, and you've got three things there that just, and it, I want you to see this, we'll refer back to it. But there's three things uh, on there, three monuments, three steles, three inscriptions that have been found. And we'll go down to the bottom down there, Moab, the Moabite stone. Uh, that is on this paper right here that I've also handed out to you. The Moabite stone is also called the Misha inscription or the Misha, Misha stele or steel. 
uh, what you have there is the king of the Moabites. I'm going to erase this now. You've got this on your, on your map. The king of the Moabites and, is Misha, and they have been oppressed by the house of Omri. There is Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea. Here's Jerusalem. Here's the border. Here's Samaria. Up here is a place called Dan. That's the northern boundaries of Israel. And then you've got up here the Arameans or the Aram. Here is Moab. And in Omri, and again, Omri and Ahab, that whole line of the kings of Israel, they're wicked kings. They've gone astray. They're not following God, but they are successful. They're good at what they do. And they are going to be oppressing the Moabites, and, and the Moabites are going to be paying tribute. King Misha, and this stone was found, and you can see more details on this. This stone was found in 1868 by a Bedouin. And there's the negotiation. They're trying to find, you know, get this. And you can see, see it's all broken up. I mean, this is just sad. If you're into archaeology and into history, this just breaks your heart. Because that was at one time in 1868, one solid stone made out of basalt stone. If you went to Israel, remember the basalt stones up in Capernaum, the black stones, it's been carved and polished. And all the inscriptions, all this area is basalt stones, a lot of basalt stones. Uh, and it was all one piece. Well, because of the negotiation they're trying to make, I'm sorry about that light. <laughs> if you need to go, I don't know, if you want to move or something, or shut the lights off, screw the, there we go. <laughs> they screw the light bulb in or just burn out. Are you okay? Are you going to survive? <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, now we don't have to look at the, oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'll talk to our maintenance crew here at the uh, Generation Word. Well, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Anyway, negotiations. They took it, and you see it's all shattered. They busted it. They crushed it. And everybody took a part, and they disappeared with it. It's like, and, and you can see the part on the left, they never found it. The, some of the stuff, if you could do more research, some of the stuff they never found, but they had already laid a piece of paper over it and did that little pencil drawing on it to pick up all the lettering. So we've got parts of it, but the other part, we, we never found it. It's still out there somewhere. And so, uh, we're talking 1868, we're so close. And uh, anyway, what's interesting about this, and I made two sets of copies of this. One set, when it's just front and back, I didn't get a chance to underline it. The one that's got two different pages, I've underlined it. And this is the inscription. The, whole, the back page is the inscription. I am Misha, son of Chemosh, God, king of Moab. And again, Misha's the king, his God is Chemosh. And he's basically going to blame the oppression the Israelites had on them was because of their rebellion towards their god, Chemosh, and Chemosh was punishing them by the Israelites. But they got back in line with Chemosh, and Chemosh gave them a great deliverance. But the underlying parts, it's the one, two, three, fifth line down, says, this is reading right off that stone now. Omri was king of Israel and oppressed Moab during many days. Uh, then later on it says, Israel said, I shall destroy it forever. Now Omri took the land of uh, Madaba and occupied it in his day and in the days of his son, 40 years. Who's his son? Ahab. So he doesn't call, he doesn't, Ahab's not mentioned here, but he's mentioned as the son. And goes on and talks all about that. The name Jehovah pops up, Israel pops up again. And, uh, and, and those are all, you know, you've got the whole inscription, I'm going to read it to you. But what's interesting there is Omri's mentioned, his son is mentioned. Uh, Misha credits the oppression to Chemosh, uh, and he got some details there. Anyway, that's the Moabite stone, and it fits because what's going to take place, 2 Kings is going to going to begin with Moab revolt. Once Ahab dies, after Omri dies and Ahab dies, when Ahaziah becomes king and he falls through the window, you know, and during his first two years, Moab says, hey, the great kings are gone. Let's see what their sons can do. And so they rebel, and Chemosh, their god, gave them a great victory against the Israelites and Jehovah. Okay? And, and so they, they make credit for it. And get, the second kings begins with Moab rebelling and having a victory over Israel and no longer pays a tribute. That's how second kings begins, and that's what the Moabite stone tells you. That's kind of interesting. It parallels. It's, it's, it's perfect. Now, that's one stone. We move further. Well, let's go all the way to the top. Now, we've talked about Judah, Israel, Moab. Of course, Edom's down here. Very important place right here, Ramoth, Gilead. Again, that's the trade route. Goes up through Syria, through Dan, up through Damascus. But north of Syria is a rising empire called the Assyrians. Selmaneser III 
is the king up there. And even though Israel, Ahab, and Ben-Hadad, the Arameans, are fighting against each other, there's going to come a time where they're going to unite to push Salmaneser III back. There's going to be a battle. You can see I've got it on the map right there. It's up right up there kind of where, I, if you know the New Testament, right around where Antioch is at, right just to the right of Cyprus. It's called Karkar. Karkor, however, Q-A-R-Q-U-R. There's a battle there. And in this battle, ben, now there's just a little bit of hint about this in the Bible, but you know how those, when a king dies, it gives you a little bit of a description. It says, and all the other records are in recording the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah, but where are they? So there's a lot of other details that we know about. But here's an example. This is not from the kings of Israel, but this is a, a monument called the Kirka Monolith of Shalmaneser III, because there's another one by his son. Uh, it comes from 853 B.C. And Shalmaneser III meets Ben-Hadad II and Ahab, who have united together at the Battle of Karkar, and is defeated. And in this, on this monument, it tells, you can see down there right in the number two, number three on the very bottom, it describes the battle in 853, and it mentions Ahab, the king of Israel, bringing 2,000 chariots into the battle, along with 10,000 soldiers allied with Ben-Hadad II of the Arameans, who brought 1,200 chariots and 20,000 soldiers. So once again, the fact that Ben-Hadad and Ahab had relationships as far as politically, and the fact that Ahab was a great military leader, and we've got a date of 853 when Ahab, the king of Israel, met the Assyrian king in battle along with the, the Aramean king. It's, it's documented on this other description. It's what does it say? Uh, well, okay, I guess it's about four feet tall or something. I don't know how big it is. The other one was three foot tall. Okay, so now you've got another detail of Ahab and, and information there. In our story, uh, we're going to have... Uh, we remember when, uh, Eli I'm rushing ahead here, but Elisha is going to anoint Haziel as king over the Arameans. He's going to approach the king uh, of Israel on his deathbed and say, uh, strike the arrows on the, on the ground, and he's going to pronounce a curse or something towards the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Arameans. And the Arameans, Haziel is going to eventually, right around, is it 841, I believe, B.C.? Haziel is going to end up destroying northern Israel, taking up this occupation. Uh, I'm trying to put all this together. Jehu is going to be a general over here in Ramoth Gilead, kind of on the front lines. A prophet is going to come over and anoint him. We believe, uh, the Jewish scribes believe, that it was uh, Elisha sends a young prophet. They believe it was Jonah. It, it's pretty, it's very reasonable that Jonah's the one who runs over here and anoints Jehu, who then turns and has a coup against the king of Israel and the king of Judah, who've united together, the two cousins, basically, and it kills them both. When that takes place, Haziel comes down and occupies this territory up in here, and he's going to put up a monument, and it's going to be there for about 40 years, a monument that they have found. It's called the Tel Dan inscription, and there's a picture of it right there. And I've got more detail right there, number two. On this Tel Dan inscription, it was found in 1993-94. I mean, very recent. It was set up right by the gate, and many of us have stood at the gate. We've seen the, the, those were the shrines where they saw where the king's seat was put. We can see the basalt pavement stones there. You can see the remains of the gate. It was right there in the entrance of the city. It was apparently on one of the outside walls of the city, and it was... It was taken and crushed, probably around 1800, 800 B.C., about 40 years later, when the king of Israel drove the Arameans back out, and they took over the city, and they crushed that stone and used it in some pavement. Well, when they were excavating it, they found it. And on this inscription, it's, it's again basalt, and it's set up at Dan, which is the northern most important holy site, so it's an important site, and they claim victory, likely Haziel in 841, he had subdued northern Israel. It claims victory over Israel, and it mentions the house of David because they had defeated Israel, and they had killed the king of the, from the line of David. Now, as we know, the Bible says Jehu led a coup 
and kills these two kings, and that's when Jezebel gets pushed out the window. But that's when Haziel moves in and takes credit for it and says, I killed these guys. The Bible says Jehu killed them, but Haziel just considers it part of the battle. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's like he himself didn't come down and kill the kings. But he says in this, this, this inscription, he says, uh, he claims to have killed King Joram uh, and regained the territory of Israel and King Ahaziah at Ramoth Gilead. And we'll read that in 2 Kings 8. And then it was probably crushed and then uh, destroyed. That monument or inscription was destroyed around 40 years later. So we have got the Assyrians, we've got the, the Syrians or the Arameans, and we've got the Moabites with inscriptions from 1848, excuse me, 840 BC, 850 BC, that runs perfectly parallel with the names in the right order, naming the foreign kings. I mean, it's one of those things. It's like you, this is this is no longer just a Bible story. You know what I'm saying? It's not just something someone made up. You know, it, it's no longer fixed. You've you've left the world of make believe and have entered into a historic. I mean, we've been saying that from the beginning, but now we've got. We've got stones, we've got inscriptions uh, that, I don't know, it's kind of exciting. And again, it, it makes this whole story come to life a little bit more for me, making it historical. We've got real dates. These are people moving in history. And again, we see Ahab and Omri as great kings, great military leaders, oppressing Moab, defeating the Assyrians, siding with the, the Arameans, sometimes going to war with the, with the Arameans. And in the midst of all that, who shows up? Elijah giving directions in this heated political climate. Elijah's not just some ghost prophet walking around someone made up. He's walking in in the middle of this saying, this is what the Lord says. You can do it if you want to, otherwise it's not going to rain. Or he's going to mention when uh, the king of Israel goes down to, as we begin chapter 1, he's going to go down to Ekron to ask about you know, what's going to happen to him. Elijah is told by God, intercept those messengers. So, I mean, so you've got Elijah, okay, and Elisha is going to be the one who anoints the king, who upsets the dynasty up here, and turns the Arameans on, on, on their side. So anyway, Elijah and Elisha are moving throughout this whole realm as we continue the story. Are there any questions or insights? Did I say something? I mean, I rushed through that, obviously. And I want you to kind of get a background because I want to refer to this several times. If you care, you can read more about the Moabite stone here. You can Google uh, and I've got stuff uh, other places about the Tel Dan inscription. You can Google the Shalmaneser. You can see pictures of it. Everybody's talking about it. Well, in certain circles, everybody's talking about it. In other circles, like, I don't know, I don't want to say anything negative, they've never heard of it before. And you'd think that if you carry a Bible to church, this is kind of some information you'd like to know that it matches. You know, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a fable. You don't have to make stuff up. You just kind of teach what's been given. All right, here we go. Questions or comments? Anybody want to say anything? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I, I, I just hope I don't I get too excited. I'm so excited I start not teaching well because I, because you know, there's like, you could spend, we could spend, you know, five weeks talking about each of those stones, the history of it, and all the things that are in it. I kind of leave that there for you to, you know, research if you want to. But it's, it's there, and you, and you really... Some archaeology things, they, they're debated, is it a fraud, is it real, is it, are you, what age does it fit in? These are three things you really can't, I mean, there's no one really arguing with it. The closest you come to is like Moab, they say, well, they're just recording some legends about some kings that everybody kind of had the same stories. Really? It's like, it's like you're just recording all the same le legends and everybody's united from all these different cultures and telling, it's like, come on guys, you're, you're making stuff up now. This, this, is, this is history right here. And again, the vast majority of people accept that. I'll pray and then I'm going to start chapter one of 2 Kings and, and try to, I'll try to refer to this, but try to keep these things in mind as we move through this. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for your truth in the word of God. We thank you for recording these historical facts and showing yourself strong through history, yourself strong through your people, leading and guiding, disciplining, punishing, and, and, and bringing people up and bringing down nations, Father. We stand before you today humbly wanting to hear your word, understand who you are, that we may walk in our own personal lives and in our family lives, obedient to you, but also that we may be the salt, the light to our generation and to our own culture, that we may bring the light to many people, that we may even uh, have a chance to help bring revival to our people. Again, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for revealing yourself to us, and ask that we take these things serious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Kings. After Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. 
Does anybody know what we're talking about there? That's when Misha sets up the Moabites on. They rebel because Ahab's dead. He's got his son on the throne. Let's see what these guys are made of. We're going to rebel. Now's the chance. Now Ahaziah, that's Ahab's son, had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and injured himself. In other words, he, the lattice was covering the window. He fell out a window, apparently, and, and he's in Samaria. And I don't have it right here to be Samaria. That's the, that's the capital that his grandfather, Omri, had established. He took the hill and made his own capital. So he sent messengers saying to them, Go and consult Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron. Now, if you look in your footnotes, most likely, most footnotes, I'm not sure if you got some there, but Baal-zebub means god of the flies. And it's probably a, a play that the Israelite writers use because it, it, just to change a letter or so, it means uh, Baal the exalted. But you switch a letter, it means Baal, god of the flies, or god of the flies, Baal of the flies. So that it may be just kind of like a national mocking of the, of the God, or else he is the God of the flies. But it's most likely a corruption of the word intentionally done to mock the God. But that's, that's something you can decide and talk about. But anyway, it says, a consult, go, the king says, go and consult Baal's above the God of Ekron. That's 25 miles. Ekron, you can see on your map, but it's just straight across almost from Jerusalem. It's in the Philistine territory. It's 25 miles away. So he says, go ask the God uh, of, the, uh, of, of the Philistines to see if I will recover from this injury. Now, I'm not sure what had happened, you know, if he hurt his back, you know, broke his neck, crushed his head. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, now we don't know where he's at, but you, listen, you do know, or at least keep in mind, Elijah may have an attitude problem, okay? I mean, we, or a self-pity problem. He's not necessarily, uh, do what you want to with him, okay? But here, he, you can, I think, he, just think he's got an attitude problem. And, and just anticipate, you know, what's going to happen here in the story. Now remember, this is the Samaritans. This plays real big into the New Testament. John and James, when Jesus was going to go through Samaria to Jerusalem, and the, the, the Samaritans wouldn't let him come in. He had to go around, go over, and go down the Jordan Valley and come across this way. That's where he comes in from Jericho, Palm Sunday, where he, uh, what's his name in the tree? Zacchaeus, you know what I'm talking about. He wanted to go down through Samaria, but they says no. So he had to, this is the Lord. No, okay. So he had to go down here this way and come up and approach from Jericho, and that was the Palm Sunday. But when James and John, what did James and John say? Lord, you want to call fire out of heaven on these Samaritans? We know, we've seen it done, we've read about it. Well, this is it right here. <laughs> but the angel of the Lord, and again, I would say that you got to consider that to be a manifestation of the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, if you read that in from the rest of the scriptures. <laughs> Not just an angel, but the angel of the Lord, the manifestation of the word, the messenger from God. Again, we could talk about that. Most, most scholars agree that's manifestation of the Son of God when it says the angel of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Said to Elijah the Tishbite, go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to consult Baals above the God of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went. So we don't know where Elijah was, if he'd gone back home, but, or if he's somewhere hiding. We don't know where he's at. But he's going to go somewhere between Samaria and Ekron. He's going to go and wait for them. So when they come walking by, he's going to intercept them and say, Hey, you don't need to go all the way to Ekron. I'll just tell you what God says. So here it is. When the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, well, why have you come back? They said, a man came to meet us. They replied, and he said to us, go back to the king who sent you and tell him, this is what the Lord says. It, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending men to consult Baals above the God of Ekron? Therefore, you will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. The king asked him, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you that? Who? What kind of man was he? Describe him. Again, it's interesting, they don't, they don't say it was Elijah. I mean, that would be, you'd think that we would anticipate that they would say, well, it's that Elijah guy, the guy that caused your dad so much problems. They go, well, he was a man with a garment of hair, probably sackcloth or goat, goat, or, yeah, goat hair, with a leather belt around his waist. So that was Elijah's garment that, that they identified him. The king says, that was Elijah the Tishbite. That's Elijah. That's exactly what Elijah looks. That's it. That's his garment. Then he sent to Elijah a captain with his company of 50 men. 
the captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, come down. So again, we don't know where this is at, but somehow Ahaziah knows where Elijah is. Maybe he's waiting at the same location. He's on a hill. So you can imagine there's a road going from, I mean, I'm making this part up. I'm, I'm adding to the story. I'm not sure where the road's at, where Elijah's at. But I'm assuming he's just kind of staying in the same place, somewhere between Samaria and Ekron. And there's the road, and there's a hill on the side of the road. He's just sitting there on, on, the, on the hill waiting for the king to come talk to him. I, I don't know. But the king seems to know where he's at. And he says to him, they say, man of God, the king says, come down. So they call him a man of God or a prophet. And meaning, if, if, if you're really meaning he's a prophet, then why don't you ever listen to me, is what he's saying. And again, you're dealing with Elijah, who's probably got an attitude problem. And the power of God to go with it. So you mix an attitude problem with the backing of God as a prophet. Don't, don't, don't touch this guy. Just, just listen to him. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, or if I am a prophet of the Lord... May fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. If you really think I'm, then you shouldn't be afraid. Don't believe it. But if I am, may fire consume you and your 50 men. So he sent 50 men out to get him. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. Now, this is the second time Elijah's called fire out of heaven. Remember Mount Carmel? Now he's just consuming people. Here's the prophet of God sitting on a hill consuming people with fire. At this, the king sent to Elijah another captain and with his 50 men. The captain said to him, now, amen, I am assuming Elijah's just kind of camped out there on top of a hill somewhere. And, and there's smoldering remains of 51 burnt people down there. And he's just sitting there at the top of the hill, unless he moved hills. Because, I don't know. So here comes another captain and 50 more men from the king. He says, man of God, this is what the king says. Come down at once. If I am a man of God, Elijah replied, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. Now remember, these are Samaritans getting smoked by God because they're getting mouthy with the prophet. This is, I, I'm going to say, exactly what John and James were thinking. Again, I, I don't know for sure, but it sure seems like it fits. When the Samaritans, when Jesus was going to go through, and they says, no, go around. He says, they don't treat you like that, Lord. Do you want us to just go out there and call fire down and consume them? Just like Elijah? He says, uh, and again, Jesus doesn't say, yeah, I really admired, I really appreciate how Elijah handled situations. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. Let's walk around. So, I mean, even right there, it's interesting that the Lord has already seen Elijah. He may not be giving approval of, of Elijah's behavior even here. I, I don't know. So the king, in verse 13, the king sent a third captain with his 50 men. This third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged. Now again, he may be sitting amongst the remains of 102 smoldering men. And he's, he, he says, I know who you are, man of God. <laughs> Look at the dead bodies. And you're just sitting there just, you know, roasting marshmallows on your campfire on top of the hill or something. They roasted marshmallows back then. This third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these 50 men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men. But now have respect for my life. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. Now, again, if that is, again, the son of God or the second man of the Trinity, he's been watching this whole thing. He goes, okay, I think we've got their attention. You can go down with them now. So Elijah got up and went down with him to go to the king. He told the king, and, and this is interesting, this is a little bit about, this is a great example right here of, of here's the word of God, here's what the Bible says, yes, but I've got a question for God. Okay, now you meet God, and he says, what's your question? And you know what he's probably going to do? He's going to do this. He's going to hand you a Bible. It's right here. But I want, you, I want a special revelation. Well, here it is. He's already been told, the king's already been told twice what God's answer is. So now here's the prophet standing in front of him. Now he's going to get the real word of God. Let's see what it is. Verse 16, he told the king, this is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you consult, for you to consult, that you have sent messengers to consult Baals above the God of Ekron? Because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. Can I get a different word? No, that's the word. It's not going to change. You're going to die. You went the wrong way. So he died, according to the word of the Lord, 
as Elijah had spoken. And he said the same thing three times. Notice Elijah didn't adjust the message. He didn't, you know, uh, you know, acclimate to the climate. He just, this is the message. Okay, because Ahazi had no son, this would be Ahab's <laughs> oldest son, Joram, this would be Amaziah's brother, or Ahaziah's brother, succeeded him as king in the second year of Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat. So down, in, down here, Jehoram is king, Jehoshaphat's son, and he is married Athaliah, Ahaziah, and Jehoram's sister. As for all the other events, or Joram's sister, as for all the other events of Ahaziah's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? We don't have those, of course. But do realize there's other records that, you know, on stone that we've we found, uh, including the rebellion that Moab has rebelled at this time and won a victory. So it doesn't tell you that he lost a victory, but it does say that they revolted at the beginning. And that, that's not recorded in the, the, in the Bible, nor do we have the annals of the kings of Israel. But we do know that Moab records in a little more detail what took place from their perspective. Chapter 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Now, this is going to... This is gonna, De de derail us for a little bit, you know, because we're going to go talk about Elijah and Elisha, which is fine. Uh, but I do want you to jump over to chapter 3, because all we've read so far is that Moab revolted. But in chapter 3, Joram, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. I'm in chapter 3, verse 2. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal and his father that his father had made. So in other words, he's kind of trying to clean up his act. Maybe Elijah had an impression. He's not going to go David's direction, but he is going to kind of drift away from his father. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Again, that's Jeroboam who sent the golden calves to rewrote history. I mean, they don't know where to go. When they, when they repent, they don't know where to go when they repent. They're going to get rid of these stones. But where do we go? We don't have any history. We don't have the word of God because Jeroboam took that all out of our history. And so uh, I'm repenting, but I really don't know where to go. So he got rid of the Baal stones. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He did not turn away from them, maybe because he didn't know. Now look at this verse 4. Now Misha, king of Moab, have you heard the name Misha before tonight? Yes, Misha is on the stone. He's the one who wrote the Moabite stone. Uh, now Misha, king of Moab, raised sheep, and he had supplied the king of Israel with 100,000 lambs and with the wool of 100,000 rams. And that's probably not, you know, uh, uh, sales. He's probably paying tribute. They're under oppression. That's Ahab is oppressing Moab. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So, that, so at the, that time, King Joram set out from Samaria and mobilized all Israel. So his brother had fallen, didn't have a chance to take care of this. Moab said, we're not sending any more or sheep. We're not sending any more wool. You're on your own. They cut off the supply route and put their troops on the border. Uh, Amaziah never responded. He fell to the last, and he's trying to you know, fin figure out if he's going to live or die. Well, now it's been two years since they paid their tribute. Just like Nebuchadnezzar marches, he eventually marches down and destroys Jerusalem. Now, with the new king, Joram, he's going to march out and meet Moab and say, enough, we want our tribute, just like you've been paying my father and my grandfather. Um, so now we're in verse 5. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So at that time, King Joram, Ahab's second son, set out from Samaria and mobilized all Israel. He also sent this message to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? The king of Israel, or Judah says, I will go with you. Again, they're, they're intermarried now. You know, his, his son's married to Joram's sister. I am as you, and my people are as your people, my horses as your horses. This sounds like what Jehoshaphat had said when they went to war against Ben-Hadad. By what route shall we attack, he asked. Through the desert of Edom, he answered. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. Okay, so they've gone down around this way, and they're down here, and there's no water. They've gone into the Negev. They're out of there. They're, they're used to being, Israel is used to being up here where there's a lot of water and dam. They're, they're used to this area, the fertile uh, uh, Jezreel plain. They've gone now down south of Judah, down to the Negev. They're going around the bottom of the Dead Sea. It's like, we didn't bring our canteens. We're out of water. It's interesting. Elisha is going to show up right here at this time. Now, that, that's coming up here. Let's go back to chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind... Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal 
Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. And so there's a series of towns right in this area. Gilgal is right about here. Bethel is here. Jericho is here. And they're going to be making these rounds through these cities. It appears the school of the prophets, it's pretty clear, there's a school of the prophets at each of these locations. There's, there's prophets in training. Remember, uh, at, at the high place of Gibeon, he, uh, Samuel had, uh, uh, what was that place called? Uh, Ramah, Ramah, uh, Naoth. Remember that place? There's like the school of the prophets. And when they, would, they, they included music, it included uh, teaching them how to prophesy. And it's interesting, when we get down here, Elisha is going to call for a, a, a musical instrument to, to prophesy. So they, we know from Samuel's day, the school of prophets included music. They included training on prophesying, how to hear the Spirit, move with the Spirit. It included some kind of a static speech, you know, including prophecy. We see Samuel, Saul, even David going through that. So these things are going on. They're being trained to be prophets. They've dedicated their lives to this. Elijah is apparently in the position of leadership. We don't know a lot about it. I mean, I, I'm kind of speculating. Samuel had these. Elijah seems to be the leader, but when Elijah goes away, Elisha is going to take over the leadership of these, these schools of the prophets. And there's a several stories that are going to come up, and this is where Jonah is going to come out of these schools. Micah is going to come out of these schools. Different, different prophets are going to rise up out of these schools that if you don't pay attention, they just show up. But they don't just show up. They've been trained. They're, they're the school of the prophets. And not every prophet has a book. Not every prophet is, is a famous, famous prophet. Okay, here we go. Uh, I am in uh, verse. There's no. I mean, but Elisha, as surely as low, I'm in verse. I'm going to go back to. I don't even know what verse two. Two. We have a, we have a question. Mm -hmm. How can you be trained to be a prophet that God speaks through? I wanted the same thing about pastors sometimes. <laughs> well spoken. Follow the back into your court. Okay. <laughs> Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. So he's going to stay there. And now it appears, again, remember, Elijah is a loner. And he's, he, even from the beginning, he was supposed to anoint Elijah. Remember, he threw his cloak on him and, and walked away. He says, what have I done to you? He says, you're a prophet. You're on your own. And Elijah seems to have kind of traveled around and followed him. And Elijah, I, I'm adding to this, you know. But it seems like Elijah's always trying to ditch Elisha. Would you stop following me? And I'm a loner. And he always was always alone. But Elijah was always right there to kind of pick up the pieces. But here he's going to, it's time for him to be taken to heaven. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went on to Bethel. So Elisha says, no, I, I, you've been trying to ditch me since I started. I'm not going to leave now. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, now this is interesting. They says, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Now, so again, we need more information sometimes, but it appears that the spirit of the Lord is speaking through these prophets and manifesting some information to them. And it's consistent at all. Because every time they come to a city, it's like, guess what the Lord said today during the prophecy meeting? That, you're, that Elijah is going to be taken from you. He goes, yeah, I know. It's like, we, that's, the, that's the word. Now, how do they know? It appears to be a prophetic message. Maybe Elijah had says, you know, this is the day that I'm going to be taken away. Maybe he dated the rapture. You know, it's like, you know, is that a date? I don't know. Yes, I know, Elijah replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. So in other words, it appears he's not just randomly walking around. He's going to each of the schools of the prophets, maybe with his final message. Maybe it's... Maybe it's with that final message that he says, today I'm going to be taken up. Then they come out of the meeting. He says, Elijah says he's going to be taken to heaven today. And he says, I know I've heard, already heard the message over at Bethel. Now he's going through and telling the same message. So it appears Elijah is checking with each of the schools as, he, as he's leaving. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives, uh, he says, I'm going to go to Jericho. Uh, I will not leave you. Verse 5, the company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. So he's gone from Bethel to Gilgal to Jericho, and now he's going down to the Jordan. So he's going down, he's going downhill. It's a definite, you know, 
it's a definite move down. I mean, it's it's sandy. It's as close as you get to the Jordan, you go through the wilderness, and then pretty soon you're in the in the Jordan Valley. So the, it's it's not impossible for these people to be standing. In fact, in Jericho, you can stand in Jericho and look down over the sandy desert area and look down and see the Jordan River. So it's not impossible for these prophets to be standing up there just looking and watching Elijah and Elisha walk away or following him. Um, verse 6, Elijah says, Stay here, I'm, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he replied, Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. So they stopped on some high place like on a hill, and they're looking down and watching these guys down on the Jordan Valley. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now that's a common story. I mean, it's like, sure, what does Elijah do against the water? Rolls his cloak coat up and strikes the water. But where did Elijah learn this? I mean, that's, it's like, we know it from stories and, and Sunday school and hearing sermons about it and messages, but it's like, out of nowhere, Elijah gets to the river, rolls up his cloak, strikes the water. Now, he's basically doing a reversal of Joshua entering the land. He's leaving the land. He's from over here, Gilead. He's from the Tishbite from over in this area. He's come over to Samaria. He's now in charge of these schools, apparently, of the prophets. Now he's going back across the Jordan to where he came from. He's going back across the Jordan from where Israel entered the land. But he's going to go over on this side. He's going to be taken up from this side of the Jordan. He's going east of Jerusalem. I mean, I don't have an answer. I'm just telling you information. I mean, why is this happening? Why, is, why, doesn't he, why does he have to cross the Jordan? Why does he strike? Why does the water stop flowing? Um, Elijah, uh, verse 8, Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. I don't doubt the story at all. I'm just trying to understand where they got the idea, what does it mean, what are we supposed to learn from it, other than if you're stuck and you need a slide. You know, what, what does it mean? Where did Jesus figure out how he could walk on the water? I mean, it's, these are just stories, but there's something going on. Then he, uh, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? What, what can I do for you? Why are you still here? Uh, meaning, I'll bless you. I'll pray for you. What do you want? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. In other words, the power you had, the anointing you had, the word that you had, the, the ministry that you had, I want twice what you had. I want to do double what you did. And Elijah gives him a very good answer. And this is the truth. You have asked a difficult thing. Difficult. Difficult for who? God? <coughs> It's hard for God to do that. I doubt that's what he means. It's hard for me to do that, Elijah would say. It's hard for me to pray that way. Uh, that's, how hard is it to speak God's word? What's going to be hard is what? I think he's talking to Elisha. I've had a miserable life, Elijah. I've been on the run. I've been alone. People trying to kill me. Never settled down. And look what I, 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 I'm done. You want twice this? That's... That's going to be really difficult. I, I, don't, I don't know if you can handle it. But you've asked a difficult thing. I think it's going to be hard. I think what he's saying, you've asked something that's going to be hard to live by. <coughs> Meaning it's not just God doing things through your life. You've got to pay the price. That's what Paul says to the Corinthians. I've worked harder than all of them. It's like, what is he saying? Well, I've got, I've got more responsibility. I'm, it's costing me more to get done because of the price that, that God, the thing that God's asked me to do. It's costing me more to get it done. I think that's what he's talking about. He says, you've asked a difficult thing, Elijah says, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. He said, I'll, okay, I'll pray it. But he says, God will have to decide if you can handle it or not. When I'm taken from you, if you see me, if you see this thing take place, if you see my death, or whatever is going to take place. I mean, this gets even more confusing for me sometimes theologically. He says, if you see it, it'll be done. Count on it. Meaning, if you see it, start acting like it's true. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, there's, it's like, you'll see this, and you start doing the things that I did twice as fast. But if you don't see me taken away, then I would just kind of back off because you didn't get it. And stop acting like you got something you don't have. Don't get a TV program or something. Verse 11. As they were walking along, now they've crossed the Jordan, and they're walking along on this side of the Jordan. 
As they were walking along, talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel! And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. Now, meaning he's now mourning the loss or the death of Elijah. Now what just took place there? I mean, how does that fit in with all of theology? Is that Elijah's death? I, I guess. Now when you see, and again, I, I think a couple things there are going to be consistent in all deaths. Because Jesus mentioned about the man who, who, uh, who the, the poor man who died. When the rich man was taken into to Hades, the angels came and took the beggar. You remember that story how the angels came and took him? That's exactly what happens here. The angels came and got Elijah, but the angels also came, according to Jesus' story, the angels also came and got the beggar. So I'm going to make this, again, I'm going to make a statement. I don't, you know, it needs this discussed. But I think, I think it's, it's safe to say, or at least my presentation is, that when a person dies... The angels come and meet them and take them to the Lord. Take, they, there's, there's an angelic interception. There's an angelic appearance. I think that's. I'll make this statement. It happens to everybody. I mean, I mean, believer at least. What is unique about this story is not that the angels came at Elijah's death. What is unique about it is Elisha saw the angels come and take Elijah. He saw the visitation of the He saw into the spiritual realm and saw this take place. Um, the other thing that's, again, that's one way of looking at it. The other thing is they were taken up into heaven. And, and I'll just throw this out there so you have it, you know, we've talked about it before. I always say that in the Old Testament, when you die, you don't go to heaven to be with the Lord. And, and, and you almost have to agree with this. You go where? You go into the underworld, into Abraham's side, Abraham's bosom. You go into the underworld, and that's where Jesus went into paradise, Abraham's side. He went to the land. That's where David said he was going to go to Hades. That's where Job said he was going to go. The prophets talked about going into the underworld. Jesus says, I'll be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Why? Because that's where everybody goes when they die. In the old, You go to the underworld and wait, and then upon the resurrection, it was transported into heaven. Okay, I mean, captivity was taken into heaven upon Jesus' resurrection. And people came out of the grave, people walked in the city. Uh, and now, as, as you know, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. You don't go to the underworld today, you go immediately into heaven. But you can't go to heaven until the price has been paid, until redemption is effectual. And Jesus Christ's death on the cross was effectual. It, it made a difference. Uh, and, and, I mean, there's other examples of that. So... I th that my, what I'm saying now is Elijah was taken in, in chariots up into heaven. Now, that nullifies my point. It's like, so Elijah, remember what Jesus says. Jesus says, when he's talking to Nicodemus, no one has gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven who's going back to heaven. In other words, no one's been there. I came from heaven, and I'm the only one that's ever been there. No man is in heaven. Jesus was the first man into heaven. So that's where I've got to say right here, the angels took him. And the word heaven can mean sky, atmosphere. It can mean the abode of God. I mean, they came and took him and, and delivered him into Hades. Or they took him and he went to heaven. He's been up there waiting alone by himself again. Uh, and then you got the, you know, uh, the whole idea of Elijah coming back. Remember, Malachi says, Elijah will come back. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here, just throwing some stuff out for you. And I've got ideas on all this, but none of it's a slam dunk. Remember, when Elijah comes back, Malachi says, before the great dreadful day of the Lord, Elijah will come back. And he also mentioned something about Moses. Then Jesus, talking to his disciples, he says, if you're willing to accept it, he says, if your theology can handle this, John the Baptist was Elijah. In other words, now again, when we think about Elijah coming back, it may mean he comes back with the the, the goat hair with the belt, it's Elijah, man, you know, I hated this place the first time, now I'm back a second time. It's the same guy. I thought I was out here. Okay, but remember what the angel Gabriel told Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. He says he'll go forth in the spirit of Elijah. He didn't say your son is going to be Elijah. He's going to be John, 
and is going to have the Spirit go forth in the Spirit. Not the Spirit like the presence of the Spirit of Elijah, but with the Spirit, the attitude, the anointing of Elijah. And so, and Jesus said, he says, if you're willing to accept it, if your theology can handle this, he says, I know he got all kinds of ideas, but that was Elijah who came before the Lord. He came and prepared. Now, again, I believe, and many people do too, that there's another day coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord that Elijah will appear, and he's one of the two witnesses. Now, is that this Elijah comes back from the dead, God's been keeping him someplace special, and he comes back, and, and lives again? Or is it a man that, like John the Baptist was a man with the same spirit, the same anointing as Elijah, and there'll be another man? It's not going to be Elijah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, is it Elijah come back? Okay, yes. I like that. But is it like Jesus, John the Baptist, was that Elijah? And there's another man that's going to be fulfilling that in the future. It's not going to be Elijah the man, but a man like Elijah. You say, well, either way. But the problem comes when you've got Moses is maybe the other one that comes along with him. And Moses clearly died, but his body was hidden. No one knows where his grave is, and that was intentional so they don't make a shrine. Otherwise, everybody would be, they wouldn't be going to the Temple Mount. They would be going, after they get done visiting Muhammad's tomb, they'd stop by Moses' tomb out there in, 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 in Moab somewhere. Because there'd be, a, be, no one knows where it's at. So I think there's a place that he was buried. It says Moses was buried. But Moses is going to come back. And both Moses and Elijah were on the Mount of Transfiguration. So again, there's something going on there, and I can, I can build up this direction, I can build up this direction, and then just kind of like, I, I end up getting questions. Okay, we got some questions here, or statements. Go ahead. What about Noah's dad, the one that was taken up? Oh, Enoch. Enoch, yep. So. Enoch, again, uh, and what does that mean? He walked with God and was no more. I mean, was that a rapture? Was he removed? Uh, is he, some people, and there was a time many years ago, I taught that Elijah and Enoch were the two witnesses. And the only reason, I, really the only reason for saying that is because they both had weird deaths. You know, they both were taken up, and they're going to come back. So that would fit. There's two were taken up, two were going to come back. But whenever you talk about Elijah and his coming back, right there beside him is Moses, the law. At the end of Malachi, it's nothing about Enoch and Elijah. It's the law of Moses and Elijah. The Mount of Transfiguration is not Enoch and Elijah, it's Moses and Elijah. And in Revelation, when those two prophets show up, they've got the power to shut the heavens up for three years like Elijah did, and to strike the land with any curse like Moses did. So it's got the ministry of Moses and Elijah combined. So I've kind of put Enoch. Enoch is definitely an option, but the strongest thing is that he was had a strange death. But otherwise, he doesn't figure in. He, and he was a prophet before Israel was a nation. So both Moses and Elijah, during if they come back in the tribulation, will be ministering during the restoration of Israel. They're their two prophets. Enoch was a Gentile. And he, for me, it just doesn't fit. I mean, it's, it's worth thinking about. And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just I can't build any more on that than he had a strange death. And it was a great prophet. Had some great, and he did prophesy about the Lord's second coming. I mean, I don't know. I mean... I can't finish that discussion. I can just, like I say, send things out there. And that's what it is so often with end times. It's like you can talk about it, but you can't tie a bow around it and say, here is the doctrine of eschatology. Some people look at Enoch as an example, Old Testament example of the rapture. Right, yeah, yeah. As would Noah, who rose up. I mean, there's, yeah. there's different examples. So the thing that really, the thing that I really, that really messes my whole theology up is Elijah goes up to heaven, and it's like... You're supposed to go to Hades. And it's like, so I've got to have the chariot take him up to heaven and bring him back to Hades and no one knows where he went. Because otherwise he's in heaven alone or else I've got to rework my theology. Or is that an earlier translation? Perhaps if you went clear back, would the translation be different? Yeah, I mean, I've looked at it many years ago because I wanted to change the word to mean what I wanted. It means heaven. It can mean the sky. It can mean the atmosphere. It can mean the universe, the stars. It can mean the abode of God. It's the, it's the same word. They took him up. It would be very dramatic. What's that? It was very dramatic. Yeah, yeah. And again, what was it? Was, and here's another thing. Is it different than anybody else's death? When, when, somebody, when, uh, when Paul died, when Peter died, when Jeremiah died, what happened when they died? What happened in the spiritual realm? They just like stepped out of their bodies, so, like wandering around? It's like, or did the angels 
take them somewhere too. I mean, is, I'm also presenting, not saying it's true, but I'm also presenting the idea that this is the way it is when someone dies. The angels come and get them. And what, what is unique is Elisha sees, and he says it right here. He says, he says, right here, let me find my place here. As the verse 11, as they're walking along and talking together, suddenly the, a chariot of fire, which is how angels travel, and a horses of fire, which is how angels travel. Elijah's going to see them later in his ministry. And appeared and separated the two of them. And the miracle here is not that these angels are showing up, but that Elisha is seeing it, I think. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. These are the angelic protection of Israel. I just saw them. It's like, well, Elisha, they're there all the time. Now, later on, we turn a few pages. He's going to be in a city, and they ain't, they're going to be surrounded. It's not so much that he sees them, but he's going to open the. He's going to pray for his partner, say, Lord, open his eyes, so he can see what I already knows there. Remember when he says, open his eyes, and he says, I, I see the city surrounded by chariots of fire. Now, my point at that time is going to be, Elisha doesn't necessarily see them. He just knows they're there. I mean, it, it's like, are there angels surrounding us? Yep. Do you see them? I mean, I know they're there. And so when he says there's more than us that be with us than are for them, it's like, he says, I, I don't see anybody. He says, Lord, open his eyes so you can see what I know. Whoa. He says, I see the, the horses of Israel. The, the angelic horsemen. He says, yep, that's what I'm counting on, so don't worry about it. So and the, the, the impression here I'm going to make, make is this, is this is not unique. It's like, oh, look, there's some angels here. No, what's interesting is you saw the angels. They're always there. The, they're, they're the horses of Israel. They're always surrounding and protecting Israel. The miracle was that Elisha saw them at that time, which was God's confirmation. You got a double portion. I, I'm letting you see things that no man sees. I'm letting you see things that are true that no man knows, but they're always there. You just saw something that you don't normally see. Whoa, I got good things planned for you. And so that was his confirmation. That's where I'm going to go with it. That's not, that's, I'm not saying that's a slam dunk. Elisha's death was unique. Uh, there's not going to be a body. That, and that, that causes a problem too because you go right on with everything I'm saying so far that everybody dies this way except where's the body? So here we go. We continue. Again, I can't, I can't resolve this tonight for myself at least. Verse 13, he picked up the cloak that, he, that had fallen off. Elijah's cloak, Elijah's cloak had fallen on the ground. He picks it up and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Now, he's, he's going to reverse exactly what Elijah had done. Elijah had done. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. And now, if anything, now that's serving as a sign, meaning Elijah did this, and now on your way back, where is this God? Is he with me like he was with Elijah? We'll find out. Strikes it, walks across, and it's a sign to Elijah. But it's also a sign of those 50 men that are wondering, whoa, he's the boss now. I mean, in other words, this is, they, they saw the, his, his gift had been confirmed. Uh, verse 15, in fact, that's verse 15. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching says, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. Now notice right there, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. This is what the angel says about John the Baptist when he tells Zechariah, the spirit of Elijah will be on John the Baptist. Did John the Baptist do any miracles? No. John the Baptist, the closest thing you've got is he was out in the wilderness just complaining about everything. And then he gets his head cut off. It's like, what was that? It was, but Jesus says, if you're willing to accept it, that was the Elijah that was supposed to come. There's nobody else coming. That was it. It's like, we were kind of thought it'd be more like Elijah. Hmm? That was it. Now, that doesn't nullify the fact that there may be a greater event coming in the future during the tribulation. But that was the one that was his forerunner. But anyway, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. Is Elisha all of a sudden Elijah? No, it's Elisha, but he's got Elijah's anointing. And he went to meet him and bowed down to the ground before. And, and they went to meet him and they bowed down, meaning they, they recognize him as the, the leader, the head of the prophets. Look, they says, we your servants, of course, they're, they're going to obey him. Right away, they start not listening to him. Look, they says, we, your servants, have 50 able men. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some mountain or in some valley. 
you know, what's interesting is remember uh, uh, when Elijah appears to Ahab, uh, what was the guy's name, that the, the head of the palace that he appeared to and says, go get, Obadiah. what was his name? Obadiah. Obadiah. And Obadiah says at that point, how do I know the Spirit of God will pick you up and deliver you somewhere else? And what's interesting is that had never happened. And when Obadiah says that, and, and biblically, that had never, he'd never been picked up and taken somewhere. But Obadiah says this would happen. So you wonder if there's things that were going on in Elijah's life that we don't know about. But nonetheless, here, it does take place. They're saying that he picked him up and dropped him off. So Elijah's got this reputation that God picks him up and drops him off in different places. But Elijah, Elijah says, no, Elijah replied, do not send them. No, it's, he's not there. That's not what happened. The Lord did not sweep down, pick him up, and drop him off on a hill somewhere. That's not the point, guys. Let's go back home and get back to class. But they persisted until he was too ashamed to refuse. It's like they said, no, 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 how about this? And he goes, okay, go check. And they sent 50 men who searched for three days but did not find him. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? I told you so. Now let's get back to class. Okay. We've got a few stories here about the, the school of the prophets real quickly. Verse 19, the men of the city, Jericho, said to Elisha, Look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. And again, if you look at Jericho, it's, it's got a, a spring. It's even called Elisha's spring. There is a water spring there I drank out of. I told you that before. I, I just, just to do it, I drank. It's probably the dumbest thing I did in my life. I just took my hand and drank out of it. Just, but I did. I'm still alive. And uh, after I drank, I got kind of scared. I thought, oh my gosh, what did I just do? <laughs> it's like it probably wasn't the most healthy thing to do just drink water out of the ground in Jericho but anyway you've got the that spring causes the, you're in the wilderness sand all around but that spring there's palm trees in fact I've got a couple pictures of standing on the ruins of Jericho looking towards the Jordan and you're surrounded by palm trees in that area because of that spring but just on the other side of the palm trees is desert as far as you can see all the way up to the Jordan River so they're saying, here they're saying, they says, uh, uh, the, this, this, this town is well suited, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. In other words, something was wrong with the water at that time. Bring me a new bowl, he said, Elisha does, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, this is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. So he cures the water, and it's never going to cause death. And thus, I cook, I could take a drink by faith, knowing it wouldn't kill me. Okay. O oh, ye of great faith. And the water is, has remained wholesome to this day. And again, like I said, it's, 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 it's spring. And, and uh, I drank it. And who's the lady that the girl is with us? The Chinese girl. Chinese girl. Nancy. Nancy. Nancy drank out of it, too. And the waters remained wholesome to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. Okay, verse 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. So now he's coming up from Jericho. He moves up to Bethel, goes past Gilgal, goes to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came out of the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head. They says, go on up, you bald head. He turned around and looked at them and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. So he goes from here, goes up to Mount Carmel, and then came back to Samaria. Now, uh, the, the bald head, these youths, this is a good message for any youth group. But, uh, yeah. the, the, it's a question about are they little boys on the playground? You know, it's recess time and some kids are mocking him. And he, you know, he just, the bears come and destroy the, 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 the daycare. It's like, or the youth program. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, another way, the bald head may mean he was a bald, had gone bald. And they're making fun of his bald head. There's also... The idea, it may, you can see in other times in history, that when you dedicate yourself to an office of a prophet, you take a certain vow, you dress a certain way, and they may have shaved their head. They may have given themselves a, a, a shaved head or a bowl cut on top, and there's no hair. And so, calling him bald head 
It's like calling him, mocking him as a prophet of God. You old bald head. You're just like all these other prophets, and they're, they're mocking him. And who's mocking him? Who's being threatened by Elijah and the school of the prophets? The competition, which is the prophets of Baal, the youths that are being trained for Baal. Again, it doesn't say that in the text. It says they're young men or youths, and they're mocking Elisha and, and mocking him for some reason that he can then call a curse from the Lord down. I don't think this is... I mean, remember, Elijah called fire out of heaven and consumed them because the men didn't, they're calling him a man of God, but they didn't mean it. He says, if I'm really a man of God, may fire, and they didn't believe it, so they weren't afraid. The third guy says, he says, I, I'll, I'll call fire. They said, no, no, I know you're a man of God, and you can do it, but please don't. Okay, you believe? I do. Well, then bring me on to the king. So they're mocking him as a man. You old bald head, you're just like Elijah. You think you're a man of God. He says, okay, if I'm a man of God, I'll curse. He curses them, and bears came out and devoured 42. I guess I'm a man of God. So I, I, I'm going to put it there that it wasn't him just having a nursery devoured by bears or a daycare center, but he was having the young prophets who were being trained for Baal worship to you know, serve Baal were mocking him. There's, it was two gods in competition there, and that's what he did. Now, again, there's other things you can say about that too. Now, chapter 3, we began that. That's that re revolt right here. During all this, Moab is going to rebel or, or has rebelled, and Israel is going to march down here. Well, they're going to march down around here with uh, Jehoshaphat's going to join them. And interestingly, Elisha's going to come with the army. And when they had, when they'd run out of water, Elisha's going to be there to intercede for them down here on the south side of the Jordan. So he's going to end up, remember, he comes through these cities, goes up to Carmel, comes back to Samaria. And apparently when the king goes to war with Jehoshaphat to go against the Moab rebellion, which is recorded on the Moabite stone, Elisha is there in their midst. And that's where we pick up next week in chapter 3. I'm going to pray. I appreciate your time and your patience, and then you're free to go. Thank you for being here. Father, we do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We do ask that we'd find inspiration for our own lives, that we would find hope, that we'd find direction. And Father, we know that you're working in our lives and in our history as surely as you're working in th these days. Those were not just the days of the Bible when angels were active and your word was true, but these are the days also where your word is active and the angelic activity and all the things of the spiritual realm were also true. We ask that we would be sensitive to these things, that we'd walk in your ways, that we'd obey your truth, and that you continue to reveal your, your word to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we ask for these things. Amen. Thank you for your time.